Welcome back to the No Body Oxfordian channel. This time I want to review the Francis Bacon's genealogy of the Kings of England. This is written by Morgan Coleman. There's only one copy. It's currently at Yale and was purchased in 2013 for $50,000. And I think it gives us a new insight and possibility of where this number 40 may have originated from. This Edward Veer journey has many distractions that lead to new paths. While researching for the catalog of honor, which I'm not done with, came across this in the Royal Collection Trust. And if you go to their website and type in this number for the search, it will come up. This is an engraving thought to be around 1592. That happens to be the time period where we start to see William Shakespeare arise encoding in various poems and other pieces of literature and artwork. Now this particular engraving has the author's name, Morgan Coleman, on the top right. He was born in 1556 in Calais, and at the time this was an English territory. He was educated at Oxford. He served many nobles, including Robert Cecil. In 1592, he produced some genealogical manuscripts that presented to Francis Bacon as a way to showcase his skills. This lithograph was thought to be a second-run print of a map that Coleman did that also had a genealogy. But there are differences between the two, so we know this lithograph is its own work. So this Morgan Coleman lithograph of Queen Elizabeth and the genealogy from William the Conqueror to her led me then to find his genealogy book manuscript that was written for Francis Bacon. And there's a similar design genealogy here on the right. That's part of the manuscript I'm going to review. So this book is broken into four sections. And it starts with, in the first branch, that is for the royal descendants of the kings that came from the Saxons. It begins with Egbert, and it runs through the Norman Conquest. Then it says the second branch is but a model of what follows next. And that being the model is their lithograph diagram that I showed before showing the genealogy from William the Conqueror to Queen Elizabeth. Then the third branch shows the genealogy of the most royal, mighty, and invincible kings of England from William the Conqueror in which manner the succession of the crown of the land continued to the most blessed person, our dread sacred queen. Then the fourth branch is the alliance and matchings between the England and France, whereby the English title and right to that crown appears. And then lastly, there's a brief declaration of the reigns from the conquest until the present day, i.e. Queen Elizabeth and some descriptions of each monarch. And if we add up these page numbers, it comes to 117, and in repeated Latin gematria, that is six Bs, and we know that a B is two, so six twos is 12, and we know that's 40. Must be coincidence. And we have 24 lines in this table of contents. And we know 24 is Queen Elizabeth's secret correspondence number, but there may be also another meaning to it. So this is a page within the manuscript, just to kind of give an idea of what they look like. The circles on the left with the writing, of course, are the individual's names. These are not all the monarchs, but it does uh, give you the names of the wives and, and uh, some of their brothers and sisters. And then it gives the coat of arms. As you may have already seen in my third video, this is where I came up with the concept or theory that Edward de Vere, 1740, 17 being the 17th Earl of Oxford, and that 40 might represent something in the future. Something perhaps greater than the idea that he was 4T or the fourth T, closest to God, especially since he incorporated the 40 number into his signature as early as age 19. And in that video, I used the first monarch to be Alfred the Great, because that is what our modern understanding 
when the first individual was crowned King of England. And here is my list from number one, Alfred the Great, all the way through Queen Elizabeth being the 39th. So how does Morgan Coleman's A Contemporary Genealogy written at the time when William Shakespeare first appeared? There is growing concern of who will follow Queen Elizabeth since she had not named a successor and had no rightful heir. Compared to modern understanding of the sequence of monarchs in England, that is, of course, based on multiple sources. The English role that I talked about before and other various individuals writing about the genealogy sequence using sources that may not exist today. So let's begin. I started by finding Alfred the Great, and he is listed as number six. Well, that's not good, because I had him listed as number one. Well, the description says, the fourth son of Ethelwood, the sixth king of England. Now, the comma implies that Alf Alfred is the sixth king of England, not Ethelwood. And if we look at Ethelwood's description, he is the second king of England. But the person listed first is Egbert. But Egbert is the king of the West Saxons. But his description says he is the first that reduced the whole realm into a monarchy and commanded it to be called England. And he was crowned in the year of 802. So that makes Egbert the first king of England. He is the one that established the name England under one monarchy. So here we have a contemporary genealogy written for a man within the circle of William Shakespeare. So close in the circle that 400 years later, he is proposed as the author of the Shakespeare plays. So why is Egbert here if he is not listed as the first king of England? These little circles that contain the information for the monarchs can only contain so much. They're so small. And the information provided on this genealogy is there for a purpose. And if we read the last line, he commanded it to be called England. So Egbert becomes the father of England. Someone had to be the first to gather all the territories and name it. Although initially he was king of Wessex and Saxon, he made himself king of England. Ethelwulf, his son, then became the first crowned king of England from the start of their reign. So this genealogy is correct. Egbert was number one. Athelwulf was number two, the second monarch, but crowned king of England from the start of his reign, whereas Egbert obtained the monarchy through conquest and named it England. There's a book printed in 1623 by John Speed called The History of Great Britain, that confirms this idea that Egbert was the 18th king of the West Saxons, the 19th but first sole and absolute monarch of the Englishman. In other words, he was the first king of England. So here's our list again, and we have Alfred the Great initially in my original video being number one, but this genealogy for Francis Bacon is listed as number six. Egbert number one and Athelwolf number two. It would seem that whoever followed Queen Elizabeth would be the 46th monarch and that the theory ends here. But it wouldn't be much of a video if we didn't continue. So we have established that Alfred the Great is the sixth monarch in line for William Coleman's genealogy book he made for Francis Bacon. That puts Athelwood, his father, as the second, and Egbert, Athelwood's father, as the first. So the third, fourth, and fifth were the sons of Athelwood. That would be Athelbald, Athelbert, and Ethelred. So in the original video, Alfred the Great was first, but it is sixth in the genealogy. Edward the Elder is seventh. Athelstan is eighth. Edmund is ninth. Edred is ten. Edwig is 11, Edgar is 12, Edward is 13, Ethelred II is 14th. The genealogy list Edmund is the 15th monarch. 
However, history passed down that Swen was the next monarch after Athelred II. He, of course, was a Dane or a Viking. But what I think this tells us is those in the know and those that lived in the 1590s did not consider the Danes, the Vikings, to be true Englishmen, and thus not descendants of the English crown. History teaches us that the next monarch is Canute, Harold I, and Hartha Canute. The genealogy, however, has Edward the Confessor, which history says is the 15th, as the 16th monarch, followed by Harold II as historically the 16th monarch. And so we end the Saxon line with Edward the Confessor at number 16. His personal genealogy book uses the date of coordination, 1043, which in Latin gematria is 53, GGG, the Trinity, while the Catalog of Honor uses the year he became the king, 1042, and adding these numbers together, we get 7, but the Catalog of Honor uses a double V in the word Edward. On page 39, which summation is 12 and 40. They're so very clever. Edward the Son. So as you recall, the book is broken into branches. So the first branch were the Saxon monarchs. The second branch are the Norman from William the Conqueror. So that would make William the Conqueror the 17th monarch of England. Coincidentally, William the Conqueror was also known as William the Bastard. He was a bastard child that invaded England and took over the kingdom. And as coincidentally, the 17th monarch, and all of these efforts are geared towards the 17th Earl of Oxford, who I theorize is also a bastard child. So the second Norman monarch, or the 18th in the genealogy for Francis Bacon, is William II. Then follows Henry I, Stephen, Henry II, Richard I, John, Henry III, Edward I, Edward II, Edward III, Richard II, Henry IV, Henry V, and Henry VI. Then we have Edward IV, Edward V, Richard III, Henry VII, Henry VIII, Edward VI, Mary as the 22nd from William the Conqueror, and the 38th overall. In this, the Morgan Coleman genealogy made in 1592 for Francis Bacon. Now we come to Elizabeth. If you notice this elaborate Tudor rose encompassing her name with the number 23 above. So she is the 23rd monarch from William the Conqueror and the 39th overall. So whoever follows her, whether it's her child or some conqueror, some usurper, someone she appoints, they will be the 24th from William the Conqueror and the 40th overall, according to, again, Francis Bacon personal genealogy made by Morgan Coleman in the 1590s. So if you've made it to my videos, you know from others that numbers are important, from Waugh to John Anthony, David Shakespeare, and a new favorite of mine, Glenn Alexander. So is the number 24 and 40 just coincidence? Is it not important? Is it nothing to worry about? Am I making this up? Well, in the Catalog of Honor, the person who followed Queen Elizabeth was, of course, King James. And his page started on 240. So King James is the one that followed Queen Elizabeth historically. And so he was the 24th from William the Conqueror and the 40th overall. So the authors of the Catalog of Honor placed him on page 240. Two, four, zero. So that must be coincidence, correct? And Queen Mary ends on page 238, which is the page that Queen Elizabeth starts on. 
so they share a page. The only page that has Queen Elizabeth by herself is 239. 23 and 39. So who was how far from William the Conqueror and who was the total overall number in the monarchs was important to those in the 1590s. So now that I've mentioned the catalog of honor, we want to look at the pages 238, 239, and 240. Have they been manipulated by the editor or printer? The section on kings starts on page 1, and if we go through, they are chronologically exactly 238 pages to the page shared by Queen Elizabeth and Queen Mary, 239 pages to Queen Elizabeth by herself, and 240 pages to King James. But there are four pages misnumbered. Page number 61 is numbered 91. Page 79 is labeled 69. Page 133 is mislabeled 123. And page 141 is mislabeled 411. So whoop de doo Well, the difference is between 61 and 30, 91 is 30. 79 and 69 is 10. The difference between 133 and 123 is 10. And the difference between 411 and 141 is 270. Add in the double digit page differences, you get 40. You add in the triple digit page differences, you get 280. And why is 280 important? Well, 7 and 40 make up 280. In Edward de Vere's signature, the 7 and 40. Must be a coincidence. Now the Catalog of Honor has in a section for Scotland, but it's not included in the Catalog of Honor. I've been looking for it because I think it's important, but it doesn't exist. Or at least it doesn't exist for these publishers. The next section is the Prince of Wales, which according to the Table of Contents starts on page 97. But in reality, we jump from page 241 to 290. And there are a host of missing pages. 481 to 484 don't exist. Page 487 and 488 do not exist. But page 328 is mislabeled 318. Page 452 is mislabeled 412. Page 548 is mislabeled 552. 563 is mislabeled 653. Now, there are multiples of these, and you have to trust me, when you take the difference in the assigned actual page and the page it should be, we come up with the number 168. And what is 168? 7 times 24. Edward the Seventh and the 24th monarch from William the Conqueror. So what? It just happens to be that way. Who cares? What difference does it make? Well, all of these inconvenient truths end on page 700. And who's on 700? It's our buddy, Edward Veer. Not Edward the Veer, Edward Veer. And his section is 40 words. Of course, I covered this in the last video. But why page 700? The zeros are placeholders, leaving us with a single digit 7. They could have done page 70. They could have done page 7. But there's a hierarchy to the English monarchy. And so the kings come first, the Prince of Wales, the Dukes, and then the Earls. And with all the information needed to be presented, he ended up in the hundreds of pages. Like I mentioned before, there were missing pages to land him on 700. Could have done a combination of numbers to reach 7, such as 521, but 700 is clean. It's simple, and I don't think it's coincidence. I mentioned before, John Speed book of 1614, the Queen Elizabeth page, page 831. Well, if we add that together, 8, 3, and 1, we get 12. 12 is 40. She is the 61st monarch of the English crown. 
And remember, that includes all of the Saxton kings, and she is the last before the union of the whole island. But she is chapter 24. We thought she would be chapter 23. Although her secret code number is 24, she is the 23rd monarch from William the Conqueror. But what the editor did was to add a chapter 1, which is a preview of the succession of the England monarchs. And it is chapter 2 that is William the Conqueror, making Queen Elizabeth a hidden chapter 23, and the one to follow her is the actual 24th. So labeling her as a 24th is a bit confusing, but it is her secret code number. And if we notice at the bottom of the page, it's labeled GGGGGG, followed by a 2. And we know G is 7. There are 6 Gs and a 2. So there are 12 Gs and G is 7. So 740. And please notice this book does a good job of noting where the monarch is in the entire line. Queen Elizabeth is the 61st monarch, which includes the monarchs of West Saxon. So let me restate that. She is the 23rd monarch from William the Conqueror. She is the 39th monarch from Edgar. And she is the 61st monarch, including the West Saxons. So that would make whoever followed her the 24th monarch since William the Conqueror, the 40th since Edgar, and the 62nd to include all of those kings of Wessex. And so we know the repeated Latin gematria for 24 is double A, and for 40 we use 12 and 88, 88 being four Ts or 40. 62, though, is three Qs, and we have not seen that in our decoding. But according to John Speed in 1614, James I was the first monarch of the whole island of Great Britain, uniting under one the same and the most glorious crown. So they restarted the count at one, not 24 or 40 or 62, but one. And he is, of course, on page 883. The 88 is superset above the 3, indicating 40. But if you add the numbers together, they are 19. And 19 is a combination of 7 and 12, 12 being 40. So another representation of 740. So to recap, the right of primogenitor would mean whoever follows Queen Elizabeth would be the 24 and 40 monarch, but it wasn't. It was King James. He was the first and the first. He began a new era because he combined the monarch of Scotland with that of England under Great Britain. So let us keep looking for breadcrumbs. Back to the Queen Elizabeth page. Below her name is the monarchy crown with the coat of arms shaped as a rhomboid, reserved for unmarried or widowed women, even an unmarried queen. And below is a banner that is left blank with no motto. But according to heraldic law, women, including the queen, are not allowed to have mottos, mantlings, helmets, or crests. And I was told by a British historian that there was no hidden message here. But why would Morgan Coleman, for Francis Bacon's book, Leave this banner blank. Why waste the time and energy? I think historians might say that perhaps in the future she would be married and the husband's motto would go into this spot. But this is Queen Elizabeth in 1590s. It's already been established she will not get married. There will be no motto in the banner. So why place it there? I just don't think we'll ever know, but it is a curiosity. The same historian told me that context is everything in English research, but I do think that lack of context is also everything in dealing with the time from 1550 to 1630. There are just too many head-scratching coincidences. Queen Elizabeth's personal motto is Semper Edom. She took that from Anne Boleyn, her mother, and that translates into ever the same. And if we've seen with others, Waugh and John Anthony, ever can be veer. 
veer the same? Is this the lack of context? Is this the subtle difference, meaning, or breadcrumb that leads us to say, well, what is Queen Elizabeth's motto? Semper Edom. What does that mean? Ever the same. Veer the same. And if we take it one step further and do an anagram, we are left with veer, s, or is, hamlet. We're one letter short of saying veer is hamlet. If we do an anagram of semper edem, we can get rape, seed, mem, and mem is 40. So rape, seeded, 40. But semper edem preceded the birth of Edward Veer. In fact, it was with Anne Boleyn. But it doesn't mean the individuals of the day used anagrams, and perhaps they knew semper edem anagrammed out to Veer the same and rape seated 40. And as a result, the blank banner is the clue to the reader in the know. We will never know, but the coincidences are ironic. Did notice that the banner's right side did have a different turn in its scroll compared to the left side. Maybe perhaps this was some clue, but the other banner in this manuscript is Francis Bacon's, also has the same design pattern. So I think this is artistic license. And Francis Bacon's banner is the date of publication, 1592. Ironically, if you add those single digits together, 1, 5, 9, and 2, get 17. We add the first two digits with the second two digits, as we have done in the past. We get 107. I think they use 0 as a placeholder. We get 17 again. But 107 in repeated Latin gematria is 5 Ps. 5 Ps is 75. 75 added together is 12, which again is 40. Little stretch, but within the publication date, I come up with 1740. Must be coincidence. Another interesting artistic choice are that the five leaves that are usually seen with the rose, three of them are touching crowns. The upper right crown has a, the leaf covering a pearl, and the soul looked like the Edward de Vere signature crown with four pearls. So I talked to an expert in this field dealing with this coat of arms. She tells me that this is the coat of arms of Philip of Valu, and this is referencing the medieval duchy of Anjou, the first duke of which was Charles I, the son of the French king who established the second house of Anjou following its collapse under King Henry II of England. This picture was presented as Charles II, the son of Charles I above. That was to note his coronet. There were five pinnacles, each topped by a round object, and the placement of four lower elements, each between the five pinnacles. This, of course, was quite different than his father, Charles I, and Henry II here at his tomb. It was explained to me that heraldic crowns, coronets, and even coat of arms varied over time. But it wasn't until Henry VIII introduced the herald's visitations in 1530 that the coat of arms were first recorded. And so many of the family's heraldic devices between the mid-1100s to 1530 changed. And it was their opinion that Morgan Coleman was depicting what was as close to being known as possible by the Anjuvian Empire. In the end, it was explained to me that the coat of arms is what's important and that the crown or coronet on top reflects the coat of arms. And since this is the Duchy of Anjou, even though it is a earl's coronet, as shown here from other parts of the book for specific earls, this becomes a duke crown. In other similar books, they do use a earl crown, as seen with the pearls, and a baron's crown with seven pearls. But of course, my nobody brain, nobody Oxfordian brain, looks at this and says, well, Edward de Vere, the Earl of Oxford, used four dots, not five, but four dots in his signature. Is Morgan Coleman using the leaves to cover the fifth pearl telling us something? 
the Earl of Oxford coat of arms has a crown as well. This is it enlarged, and it has three pearls. The fourth and fifth are covered by the mantle, and it shares a similar jeweling on the band of the crown. I guess that too is artistic choice. So convenient to dismiss everything as coincidental artistic choice. The Duchy of Anjou's coat of arms has multiple different types of Florida Lee counts. Some have 20, these two have three complete ones, but ironically, this has six complete and two halves for a total of seven. And guess how many petals it has? 24. Sure as shit, some of you are saying, gee, that's coincidence. So after completing the video right before I published it, I did find this coat of arms in a 1570 book by Jeffrey Gates called The Defiance of Military Profession. And it dedicates the book to Edward Vere, and it shows the family coat of arms. It is different than the other in that the boar and falcon are reversed. But in this one, you can cl clearly see the earl coronet with the five pearls and the strawberry leaves. The jewels on the band are seven, it's ironic, but everything else seems to be identical to the Morgan Coleman depiction with the leaf covering the fourth pearl. So this video is a good example of the process that we go through. Came to the final page with Queen Elizabeth and a blank banner. So thought of, well, what can go in the banner? What is her motto? And then we research her motto, Semper Edom, which was indicated to me via research and others that it was an adopted motto from her mother, Anne Boleyn. But this book from 1604 by William Seeger, titled The Book of Royal Arms and Badges from Brute to James I. And it says, Queen Elizabeth had for her device a phoenix burning with the word Semper Edom, being a type or figure of her princely self, for of her sex she was the only phoenix then living. And although out of her ashes we cannot say another phoenix is risen, yet may we boast that out of her grandfather's cinders there is a phoenix sprung that whilst he liveth shall for princely perfection and much goodness be held as absolute as she for her many full virtues was esteemed perilous. Her Highness has also a white falcon crowned, holding a scepter and standing on a stalk of tree between two growing branches of white and red roses. An allusion, likewise, to her royal self, with the motto, Vivat Prudentia Venia. Now the two phrases that stand out most to me are, for of her sex, she was the only phoenix then living. In other words, she was the only phoenix living of her sex. In the other line, out of her ashes, we cannot say another phoenix is risen. Does that not give you pause? If the author of this line knew 100% that Queen Elizabeth had no children, is this the manner in which it would have been written? It is saying we cannot say a synonym for she did not. No. Is it in the 1600s? Is the generation of William Shakespeare, the master of the English language, so inept, so lacking of erudition, that 400 years later we are to believe that we cannot say means she did not? Well, you know my opinion, that we cannot say means we are unable to say, and in a monarchy, a violation means torture or likely death, so it's right at your own peril. Or does we cannot say mean they are unsure? Either way, the writer is not stating there is no other phoenix, there is no other child of Queen Elizabeth. Now, I've been told and read there is no evidence that Queen Elizabeth had a child. This has been vehemently denied but I also have seen no contemporary evidence of a letter, a manuscript such as this, 
or any written word saying she is without any children. Not heirs, but children. So now let's go into the fun stuff, the counting. There are 14 lines to this piece. As I demonstrated before, 14 can be E, O, Edward Oxford. The 14th word in is Edom, and Edom means same. So 14, Edward, Oxford, same. The 39th word is her, 40th is ashes. The 39th monarch is Queen Elizabeth, and the 40th is her child. Must be coincidence. What must be coincidence is H-I-R, her, the Latin Gematria edition is 34. And 34 is double 11, so twice 11, and the summation of 34 is 7. The 62nd word, which would be the 62nd monarch of the West Saxon, as I demonstrated before, is Phoenix. The counting is the fun part. So this is the original engraving by Morgan Coleman that started this whole process for me. We know Queen Elizabeth is 39th monarch, so let's start with her as 39 and work our way back. So we have 38th is Queen Mary, 37th is Edward VI, 36th is Henry VIII, 35th is Henry VII, 34th is Richard III, 33rd is Edward V, 32nd is Edward IV, 31st is Henry VI, 30th is Henry V, 29th is Henry IV, 28th is Richard II, who happens not to have a crown. Followed by the 27th, Edward III, the 22nd, Edward II, the 25th, Edward I, the 24th, Henry III, 23rd is John, 22nd is Richard I, the 21st is Henry II, and we have his son, Henry the Young, with the missing crown from Richard II. The 20th is Stephen, the 19th is Henry I, the 18th is William II, and our magic number 17 is William the Conqueror, also known as William the Bastard. Ironic how our 17th Earl of Oxford was referred to as a bastard by even Queen Elizabeth on at least one occasion, and suggestion that he may have been the bastard child by Queen Elizabeth I. So is the number 40 represented in this lithograph? If you count the total number of individuals on this page, there are 90. 90 in repeated Latin gematria is four X's. X's we know to stand for 10 Roman numerals. So that's four tens, 40. Who do we know that uses the number 40? We have 12 lines, and as we already know, 12 in Hebrew is mem, which is 40. We draw a line down the center that goes through Queen Elizabeth and the strategically placed William the Conqueror in the center. There are 44 individuals on the left, 44 individuals on the right, total of 88, and 88 in repeat Latin gematria is 4 T's, 40. This next section has taken me some time but I think I have it figured out. I've been staring at these subjects in these portraits. I've been holding their hands in odd forms and shapes. Some of these shapes and forms are impossible to make with a human hand. John Bulwer, born in 1606, published a one-volume, two-book set titled here, and I can't say the words, but the first one was The Natural Language of the Hand, and the second was The Art of the Manual Rhetoric. Within this publication was a combination of previous publications in medieval manuscripts in which monks used hand gestures to represent numbers. And his book specifically says that some follow Bede, Irenaeus, and some follow Lucas. The style of this is the left hand, as says in the book, their manner was to reckon upon the left hand until they came to a hundred. So these monks 
were able to use their left hand to count 1 through 99, and then they would reckon upon the right hand in which they can count through 10,000. So on your left hand, if you hold it out, the thumb is even with the first finger. If you curl back your thumb, that is the symbol for 1. If you curl back the next finger, that's 2, 3, stick out the pinky, that's 4, etc. And then 10 is to fold over the thumb to the pinky. And 20 position is the thumb is in, 30 is the thumb on the first finger, 40 is the thumb over the first finger, 50 is the thumb down, and you can see how this process goes on the sitter's left hand. Now if you wanted to make 21, you would use the 20 symbol with the thumb in and pull down the pinky. That would be 21. 22 would be two fingers down, three fingers down, etc. So that's how you would go from 20 to 29. You would go to 30. 31 would be pinky down with that symbol, 30. 40 would be the same, and 50. So you get the idea, all on the left hand. Now on the right hand, 100 would be the same symbol as 1, but on the right hand with the pinky down. 200, 300, 400, 500, 600, it's similar to the left hand, but only on the right hand of the sitter. So 153 would be the right hand 100, and the left hand would make the symbol for 50, and then 3. Now these are the symbols for 1,000. 2,000, 3,000, 4,000. Notice how with 4,000, the pinky is separate from the second and third digit, and the thumb is overlapping the enclosed first finger. So if you wanted to make a symbol for 1,100, you would use the thousand hand signal on the right with the pinky in for 100, and then the left hand would do the double digits and single digits. Again, it seems confusing, but once you get the hang of it, it does start to make sense. There are different variations of these, if whether you read the Bede or the Irenaeus or the Lucas. They're all a little bit different. So as with many things in the medieval period, there's no standard. One artist or one patron of an artist may want to use different style than somebody else. So it may vary from painting to painting. For example, this is finger symbols from a manual published in 1520. Notice how the 7 is different. How they represent 40 is different than the Bulware book. And 4,000 is different in the manuscript published in 1520 than that of what Bulware did. This is a portrait of Queen Elizabeth in the center. It's a copy of the 1592 portrait engraved by Crispin de Passé, the elder, shown here. Since we're talking about numbers and digits, let's zoom in on both. Let's first look at her right hand, which is on our left. Notice how the thumb is over the first finger. The second and third fingers are close together while the pinky or third finger is extended away. This is an odd way to grasp a scepter. So I think it most resembles 4,000. And as I have said before, it seems that they add the first two digits to the second two digits, so 40. So why on a genealogy engraving centered around Queen Elizabeth is she making a symbol for 40 on her right hand? I'll let you decide. Then on her left hand, holding the globe. How would you hold the globe? Is that what your finger position would be? It's very odd. Looking at the numeric digit manipulations, if you have your thumb out, that does not make a similar hand position. So you have to bring your thumb inward. So this is a representation of 20. And how they interpret this during this time, I don't know. You have 20, 20 is V, we have two fingers standing up. Is this two V's? We have two digits. Is that saying two V's? But since there's only two fingers showing, is this 
22 and 22 being the twice 11. I don't know but this means something. To show that hand gestures representing numbers is not an isolated incident, this is Robert Cecil. This is a portrait thought to be a, a copy of the original, but if you notice his right hand is making a similar gesture, his first finger to thumb or tip to tip with three extended fingers, and this is 3000. Or in a 1520 publication, it can be 300. That same publication has all four fingers extended to thumb to the side as 40. But if we notice in the picture, the thumb and the ring make for 10. And we know that 10 was Robert Cecil's secret code number, 30 was King James, and is this 40? Or is the intention here to have two fingers, two sets of two, total of four fingers for 24, which was Queen Elizabeth's secret code number? We don't know the intention. I doubt we will ever know, but there is intent here through finger gestures to demonstrate some sort of message. Perhaps to demonstrate whether you supported King James, the Scotsman, to be the next monarch or somebody else. And in my theory, that would be Edward Vere. So I think we all recognize this monument, Stratford-upon-Avon monument to William Shakespeare. Let's look at the hands for any clues. So using the 1950 manuscript of hand gestures I mentioned before, the monument's left hand, or our right to the viewer, the fingers are extended flat, with the thumb ever so slightly shown, the most resembles the hand symbol for 40. Please remember these hand gestures are shown from the viewer's point of view. So the 40 is the individual seeing their own left hand, which in this monument, it is the monument's left hand. So the monument's right hand holding the quill is extending two fingers and two fingers curled under and the thumb is hidden from the viewer's perspective. Other photographs do reveal that the thumb is there, but it is hidden from the viewer. That most resembles the same manuscript's description as 200. Notice how the thumb is hidden away and it is the viewer's right hand and in this case, the monument's right hand. And with two tucked fingers, that is two, but it, since it's on the right hand, it is 20. So the finger gesture here is 220. And if, as we've shown, and it's customary, remove the zero, they are showing 22. Twice 11, brother. On the monument's right hand and 40 on the left hand. So unreasonable theory me says that the hand with the 40 on top of the parchment is telling me that 40 wrote the parchment. The hand with the twice 11 edited the parchment. But have you also noticed the or and ghouls? In one of my first videos, I showed a lithograph using buttons to denote 12 or 40. Here the statue has 29 buttons, which is a combination of 17 and 12, and 12 as we know is mem for 40. It did hide a 30th button that's half tucked underneath away from the viewer, so the viewer will see and count 29 buttons. So even in the monument we have 40, 22, 17 coincidence. Is there a seven here? Yes, in the arch there are seven Tudor roses in the color of ore and ghouls. The monument's left hand is making the sign for 40. And if you don't believe that, then perhaps the cuffs making two V's is sufficient for 40. So remember who we're hunting, Edward Oxenford, who has seven hash marks 
four dots and a 10. So either 1740 or 740, perhaps both. So why is it on the monument that we have 740? Must be coincident. Back to the Morgan Coleman genealogy manuscript. On page 13 is this beautiful hand-drawn genealogy starting with William the Conqueror. Now the number below each name corresponds to the page of the description of the individual. Here are two additional closer views. Such beautiful detail, each leaf hand-drawn with a vein in the center. There's detail on the wood. There are even cut branches. And as we look closer at the base going into Queen Elizabeth's coat of arms, do you notice anything unusual? I have been harping away at the subtlety of these hints. They lived in a society to where any derogatory remark, comment, something out of line can end in your brutal death. So those individuals who wanted to get a message out had to be subtle. You see it now? It's a new branch growth right underneath Queen Elizabeth's coat of arms. In a genealogy manuscript for Francis Bacon, written in 1592. This is so basic in artisanship, I wonder if it was placed by a different hand. This is a picture of a new growth out of an oak tree limb. I'll let you be the judge of what this is. So I presented this finding to somebody well-versed English history that can translate Latin, Old English, provide volumes of information about the time period. And this individual quickly sent back the same manuscript and highlighted other areas. So I took these other areas, cropped them out, and laid them side by side. And let you, the reader, decide for yourself, are these all similar, and as this Learned person said, artistic choice, or is this a subtle indicator in a society where dissent is punishable by death? Here are the cropped out pieces and examples, 10 in total. And here is the branch coming off of the tree into Queen Elizabeth. Are these the same? Are the ones in the left artistic choice along with the one on the right? Or is the one on the right intentional? To me, the ones on the left, as presented in the manuscript, are budding leaves. This one on the right is a budding branch. All individuals come off a branch. So is this the branch for 40? So what is the intention here? I'm afraid we will likely never know, but I personally think this is just another breadcrumb on the pathway to 40. During my research, I did come across another, what I think is a copy of the Morgan Coleman manuscript, and it's purchased by Pepperdine University, and I've shown side-by-side -side comparisons in the next few slides of each identical page. You decide if there is no artistic change from one to the other, and as such, a copy. This is the King Henry page. I see no substantial changes between the two.
And so for the Pepperdine book, this is the Elizabeth page, and is the only page in the manuscript not completed. All the other pages seem to be completed. There are no other pages with empty designs needing to be filled in. The bottom of the order of the garter, there is an outline of a banner, which looks to be empty with any outline of a motto. So this artist was going to put something in there or perhaps leave also a blank motto. There's no outline roses and no planned leaves extending out over the crowns that are also not placed yet. So what does this tell us? Nothing. So either the artist died uh, before finishing it or perhaps Queen Elizabeth died and the artist felt no reason for it or the person with which this manuscript was made for died or was thrown in the tower. We'll never know. But the artist did have two Tudor roses here merging out of the monarch's coat of arms. A theorist such as myself would say this is an indication or hint that she had two children. Others would say artistic choice. The Pepperdine manuscript, though, did offer some interesting coincidences. After the section of the genealogy, it did provide the arms of the knights bannerets of England for the year of Edward I. Advancement to a knight banneret only occurred on the field of battle, and it was with those that showed bravery and were valiant. They would present their swallow-tailed flag called a pennon, and the points of the pennon would be cut off, providing a smaller banner, or what they called a banneret. There are four coat of arms of the Vere family listed, and these are how they look in the manuscript. The first time the coat of arms appears, it is number 14. And as we know, 14 is combination 5 for E and 14 is O, so Edward Oxford. There's a description for this coat of arms on this page, and it says in French, the Earl of Oxenford, and it describes the coat of arms. The second coat of arms for Vere is on the second page. This one is listed as number 17, and this description is for Hugh de Vere. Must be a coincidence that this one is 17. The third appearance of the Vere coat of arms, where they took the knights and baronets and then grouped them according to their counties. And of course, Vere is in the county of Essex, so it is listed under Essex, but is listed as number 1. If you've seen my previous videos, I theorized that the Essex Rebellion was actually an attempt to remove Robert Cecil from power because he was the primary architect of James taking over. The rebellion, of course, failed. Essex lost his head. Southampton was jailed, released once King James was coronated. But if you are familiar with the secret letters between King James, Robert Cecil, and other members, the first appearance of a letter referring to an individual named Forty appeared after the Essex Rebellion. And if you read the letter, you will notice that Robert Cecil is describing to King James that Forty is on board and that he is sad over his loss of his friends. I think this hints towards uh, Edward de Vere being upset that the Essex Rebellion failed and his ally Essex had been sentenced to death and that Edward de Vere was on the panel sentencing him. This is one of many videos I've been trying to get to. It's just going to take time. Back to this manuscript. In the section dealing with the Knights of Bannet from Essex, there are exactly 57. And of course, 7 plus 5 is 12, 40. Just another coincidence of an association of the number 40 with the word Essex and the Vere coat of arms. Something I noticed as I was editing, 57 is a combination of 40 and 17. 57 is 40 and 17. Must be coincidence. The final Vere family coat of arms is bordered by an engrailed sable. This is because this coat of arms is for a Hugh de Vere, but the older Hugh de Vere was the current Earl. 
so they mark the coat of arms to distinguish him from the other. This is consistent through this manuscript. As you can see, a strange, there are two. There are two Westons. There are three St. Johns, each with a different style of the coat of arms to distinguish one from the other. The experts say that the sable color has no particular significance beyond the family's virtue of consistency, but the color sable, black, carried the connotation of mourning or grief for widows and widowers. However, this Hugh de Vere coat of arms with the sable border is consistent with what is on the original roll representing his presence at the battle. But what number do you think they assigned this coat of arms? It is not the same number as that is on the roll or its position on the original roll. So what number do you think it is? It is seven. Now the artist could have chosen any number of numbers, but they chose seven. So we have Edward Vere, seven, in his signature, in this manuscript now. Number seven is sitting next to the De Vere family coat of arms that is border engrailed to mark its difference than other De Vere's living at the time. I find this coincidence unable to ignore. Remember, this is a time when they wrote everything in code, double meanings. The language was very ambiguous to give the reader one meaning if they didn't understand the coding, and to another reader who understood what they were trying to say, a completely different meaning. And for the fun part, the counting. So we count 14, 17, 1, and 7, and we come up with not 40, but we come up with 39. And who's 39? That would be Queen Elizabeth, 39th monarch from William the Conqueror. It's ironic that this is the number associated with these Oxford coat of arms, 14, 17, 1, and then the 7 with the border. Was that the intention? Who knows? So now let's spend some time talking about statistical chance and coincidence. The first veer, 14, is located on a page with 30 other coat of arms. So the chance that it was listed as 14 is 1 in 30. The next Veer coat of arms, 17, is also on a page of 30 other coat of arms. So its statistical chance to be 17 is also 1 in 30. The third coat of arms is under the Essex section and it contains 57 coat of arms. So the chance that this coat of arms was listed as number 1 is 1 in 57. The final Veer coat of arms is in a section that has 35, so its statistical chance to be number 7 is 1 in 35. So what is the overall statistical chance that four of the similar shields land on the appropriate numbered spaces? There are a total of 152 shields spanning these four sections, so the chances that these four land on the appropriate sequence is 1 in 21,374,050. So is that coincidence or by design? Now for the Latin gematria. 152 in repeated Latin gematria gives us seven O's. And as we know, O's number is 14. 14 is Edward Oxford, and there are seven of those. So like his signature, in which Edward Oxenford signs with seven hash marks, you have seven O's, Edward Oxford, seven. Must be coincidence. I just want to point out this double A headpiece that we think first appeared in 1579, so well after Edward Vere was born. The double A in repeated Latin gematria is 24. And as I've shown, 24 is the individual who follows Queen Elizabeth's position after William the Conqueror. It is also the code number that Queen Elizabeth was known in the secret correspondence with King James. Now a mother having to pick someone else over her own child as a monarch might very well use 
a child's position as her secret code number as a reminder to the reader of the letter. So when we see this headpiece, which is quite common during this time, I think we should be thinking of 24 and is a moniker for Edward Veer. So let's follow some more breadcrumbs and talk about coincidences. Edward de Vere died on June 24, 1604. So let's write those numbers out. 6, 2, 4, 16, 0, 4. I believe John Anthony was the first to point the coincidence of this out, that Edward de Vere is 6, 2, 4. But I am not one who believes that Edward referred to himself as of Veer, but instead just Edward Veer. I reviewed this in my last video on the Catalog of Honor. So I've wondered if there's something more. I think the revelation of the monarch numbers helps to clarify this. So 624, I think, is a split number into 62 and 24, which I demonstrated on the Catalog of Honor, page number 239, which is for Queen Elizabeth, 23 and 39, both representing the monarch position in the genealogy. This was also true for King James to follow her numbered page 240 or 24 and 40. So as 62 and 24. As I showed earlier, 62 is the 62nd monarch altogether, whereas 24 is the 24th from William the Conqueror. So we have it twice. June 24th, Edward de Vere, and he is the 62nd and 24th in the monarch numbers. And of course, if we add the numbers together, we come to 12, and 12 is 40. Must all be coincidence. So what of the year? If we do like we did with the signature and mirror reverse it, that gives us 40 and 61. We know who 40 is. 61, as I just demonstrated, is Elizabeth. Or if you add the numbers together, you get 7. So what coincidence? At his death, he is Edward de Vere, 40th and 7. Or Edward de Vere, 40th with Elizabeth. And the monarch numbers are 62, 24, 40, and 61st or 7th. How much more do you need to start thinking this guy was in line for the crown? It is the only plausible answer to explain his actions, his reactions, others' actions, and others' reaction to him. He gives the source for his life experience, his pain, the tragedies he experienced, the taking others did upon him, his disregard for financial care, and the leniency Queen Elizabeth showed him throughout his entire life. Most importantly, her reluctance to name an heir. Thank you for watching.